great being back up here and looking out and seeing so many familiar faces and some people I don't yet know. But um, before we started meditating, I just similarly looked out and saw all these people who I'm starting to get to know. And uh, this term Kalyana Mitta or spiritual friend came to mind. Uh, famously, the Buddha said that uh, spiritual friendship or Kalyana Mitta was the whole of the holy life. And this term is Kalyana means beautiful, or and it's usually translated in the context of friendship as uh, good friendship, noble friendship. The good friend in Chinese context is called the good and knowing advisor. And just spontaneously, as I closed my eyes after looking out at all these good people who are really coming together um, in around Clear Mountain, there was a group of people who went camping, a couple of Bodhi backpack, I think is what it was called, people going and camping together and then chanting chums, a lot of these alliterative subgroups, uh, which is great. But just looked out, closed my eyes, and almost immediately a new translation for Kalyanamitta came to mind. It was just awesome, awesome friendship. So um, it's good to be up here. Um, and I appreciate everybody being willing to try that, uh, the Pali and English chanting that we did at the beginning. Um, that section, really the whole Dhamma Chaka Pavatana Sutta, the whole discourse on the setting of the motion, in motion, the wheel of the Dhamma, it's really the overarching master narrative of Buddhism. It's the map of a happy life that the Buddha put forth. Uh, the Buddha said that all of his teachings could be subsumed within this uh, structure of the Four Noble Truths. And when I said uh, right at the beginning of the meditation that, okay, let's, now we're just going to do all of that. Uh, kind of joking, but really that um, there's a lot there in really any aspect of our practice, whether we're just doing formal sitting meditation or going about our daily lives, uh, all of it, once we figure out this structure and how, we, how to relate to this, uh, everything we do on the Buddhist path, path um, everything we do in leading a, a mature life really can be found within that. And a lot of insights and shifts of trajectory can be found when you look at uh, the different elements of the five, uh, the Four Noble Truths. And specifically what we recited uh, are basically the definitions for each of those uh, Four Noble Truths. So today I thought I would go a bit of a deeper dive into part of the definition for Dukkha and then give a bit of a deeper dive, look into the third noble truth or the cessation of suffering. So look a bit at the suffering and then what can we do about it? Because the Buddha's teaching is not just all about suffering. Uh, you've also got what to do, how to relate to that suffering, how to relate to the tension and stress and all the, um, the dukkha that we create for ourselves. Specifically, I thought to look at uh, there are three lines in that definition of dukkha, which I think are, I, and I've thought this for a while, especially relevant for convert Buddhists. So this is a term you find in socio uh, sociological circles or convert Christians or convert Buddhists. And not that anybody has to become a Buddhist, but this framework of someone who was not born in a Buddhist country um, wasn't raised in a Buddhist family, but then later in life, for whatever reasons, starts maybe reading about uh, Buddhist teachings or sits a, a meditation retreat and uh, becomes inspired. There's something which is called convert zeal, which can actually come up. And uh, that's great. You know, we find something new and we realize that there's a lot here. As I was saying, it's the master narrative for a happy life. And when you start getting glimpses of that, either in a meditation retreat or in teachings, you can sense the profundity, uh, taste, the, uh, taste the, the flavor of liberation that comes from even putting into practice some of these that you want more, and you're filled with this, uh, this zeal. But that comes, you know, we're not yet skilled. It's, it's a new thing for us. Uh, not being raised in, in Buddhist cultures, everything's a bit weird. Um, we weren't raised seeing monks or nuns, so 
especially if you're at all inclined towards monasticism, you basically just make up as you go along what a monk or a nun is supposed to be. And um, for lay Buddhists, you've got ideals about what it means to meditate and what it means to let go. Um, but these start off, and they almost can't otherwise than start off being caricatures, they're cartoons. And what I'll be speaking to is not just for people, converts, but also applies to maybe people who are born in a Buddhist context, um, say in Thailand, in a Theravada country like Thailand, Burma, Sri Lanka. And it's just a religion. It's just like, yeah, you get your parents make you go to church, you make you go to the temple, the monastery, and it's just like, okay, so whatever. Uh, you know, you're dragged there and you just do it because that's what the family does. And it doesn't really seem that profound. And you see a lot of hypocrisy, like people actually going to church, but then leaving church. Um, and everything that happens on Sunday evening or Saturday evening or after, you know, uh, all the ceremonies take place. But then you re-encounter the teachings, maybe on a meditation retreat, and you're saying, okay, there's, there's something deeper here. But specifically, the aspect of dukkha, um, which I think relates here, is um, if anybody, uh, there is value in memorizing these, some of these texts, and specifically this sutta, uh, or at least parts of the sutta, the different lines. So um, the lines I'll be speaking about are on page 106, uh, which are apiehi sampayogo dukkho, association with the disliked is dukkha, vipayehi, uh, association with the disliked is dukkha, separation from the liked is dukkha, not to get what one wants is dukkha. So for the most part, you know, we're raised as kids and we just like what we like and we don't like what we don't like. We like, you know, fruity pebbles and we like kicks and we like, you know, all the other types of uh, sweet foods and whatever. And it's just easy if our parents try to make us eat vegetables and we just don't like them. And so like association with the disliked is when our parents make us eat broccoli. And separation from the liked is when they say, oh no, you can't have those Twizzlers. Um, and it's just simple, and it's simple. And I think for a lot of people uh, going through life, that's just how you live your whole life. I like the people who I like and I don't like the people who I don't like. Um, I like looking at beautiful people and I don't like looking at ugly things. And um, yeah, that is the normal, sensual, sensual kind of material, the materialist way of looking at the world, approaching the world. And um, hopefully I think everybody who's come to an event like this, you started to realize the drawbacks of something like that. So you hear teachings like this and you sit in meditation retreat and you taste some of the flavor of, uh, of peace. You give up your phone, you give up the books, you give up the internet for a week or seven days or three days, and you think it's gonna suck, and it does suck for the first third of it. But then on day two or day in the middle section of a whatever length retreat, you start to realize, actually, I'm starting to feel a level of peace and contentment, which is way deeper, way more profound, way more sustainable, cheaper than all of these other, you know, uh, flavors that I'm addicted to and obsessed with. And uh, you're like, okay, I, I need to, I want more of this. And so you're, what you like and what you dislike start to change. They start to change and get a little bit more complicated. So this first line, association with the disliked. So you come to Buddhism and you start hearing about teachings on, you know, first it might be meditation, but you also start learning about morality or about precepts and about ideas about moderation in eating or uh, a devotion to wakefulness or sense restraint. These are things which, um, I mean, moderation in eating is, you know, talked about in, to some degree in a diet and culture in the West. But um, yeah, how, how do we become moral? It's not, how do we keep a sense of integrity? And it's not so straightforward that, oh, I want to be Buddhist, or oh, I see the value in keeping precepts, and then you're just done. You're keeping precepts from that day on. It's more difficult. You start to see, oh, the, that which is becoming disliked, I'm starting to see the, uh, 
the drawbacks, the kind of ugliness of, of being harmful and, and not knowing how to speak kindly, of being addicted to, to harsh speech and not knowing how to uh, bring our habits in line with our ideals. That's this convert dukkha part of it. I don't seem to be able to make my habits, take on these good Buddhist habits, take on this um, practice of not lying to the extent that I would like to take it on, this precept around giving up intoxicants. That's not even a thing for a lot of people. It's just, I'm going to drink or take whatever I want to take when I want to take it because I'm free and that's what I have the freedom to do. And um, yeah, that it makes me happy. So, uh, But then you see this drawbacks and you can't just go full stop. So association with the disliked is, the disliked is our own attachment to our own habits. Um, I'm seeing my own um, addictions more clearly. And that, that's painful. Um, it's no longer the pain of not getting my addictive substance. Um, it's the pain of not being able to stop smoking, drinking, lying, harsh speech, all of these things that we start seeing as beautiful. This is beautiful. I'm not taking on because it's a dogma, because it's a commandment that the Buddha said, I want to take it on because it's beautiful. And I look around at the people who have been doing it for decades, and they are bright, and they are good people, and I want to be more like them. Association with the disliked, separation from the liked, what becomes liked is I want to be a moral person. I want to be a person who can say and do, have there be integrity between those two things. What I say is what I do. What I do is what I say. That's a definition for the Tathagata, for the Buddha. We want to be like that. Um, and it, it's hard. So we see a level of dukkha there. This dissonance, it's the dukkha of dissonance between what we want for ourselves and what is actually the case. Um, and it's there in the moral realm, and it's also there in the when we come to sit down and meditate. Association with the disliked. What we start to dislike is all of our old habits of mind, which are kind of sloppy. We're not really told or given like a set in American educational institutions of uh, healthy mental hygiene, like thought patterns which are going to lead to your own suffering and the, you know, the stress and disease of the people around you. We're not taught that. Um, you know, we're just, you know, it's a great, the American education system, uh, maybe other, well, other countries have good educational systems for uh, learning practical skills like math and science, et cetera. Um, but yeah, we're deficient in this, um, in the moral realm and certainly in the, the realm of, of thoughts and how to train the mind. So we sit down to meditate and the mind just wanders everywhere. And that's really given free reign. We've given our mind free reign our whole lives. And uh, part of meditation is learning how to rein in the mind. That's a real part, certainly, of Theravada meditation. And honestly, it has to be a part of any uh, mental training is we do need to learn the mind's horses. Um, and a big part of that is learning how to rein them in, but also just uh, learning how to be OK with the horses we've got. And um, yeah, oftentimes, the mind is running all over the place. I like looking at this beautiful thing, or I want to think about this fascinating concept, or finish this program that I've got in my mind, or composing this email, and I can't stop. You don't ha have the tools to um, disengage from those thought process. And that becomes the disliked, and we become associated with it, not by any volition of ours. Um, it's just what happens. You sit down to meditate, and if we haven't been practicing, then it's like if you don't have good oral hygiene, you haven't been brushing your teeth, you lick your hand, and then you smell it, and it's going to stink. Um, I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it. Um, and it's the same. Yeah, you sit down to meditate, and uh, uh, you're, gonna, you're going to reap what you've been doing all day if you've been sowing uh, thoughts that are just you haven't been giving any attention to um, a, a cleanliness of your mental habits, then you're going to sit down and, and find the dirtiness uh, there. So how do we relate to association 
with um, things which you're starting to see as that which we want, both in terms of our daily conduct, of body, speech, and mind. Um, not to get what we want. What we want, and what we want more and more, is we start seeing um, not external beauty, necessarily, but internal brightness and beauty uh, of a spiritual path, a path of integrity. Um, so what do we do when we, when we find this dissonance? Because you can't just beat it out of yourself. Um, so I thought it would be useful to now jump, having seen this kind of unique uh, convert Buddhist dukkha, because uh, it is somewhat unique. Um, we're newly inspired, but we're also new to the skills of that it takes to actually maintain these, to start and maintain good habits. Um, so how do we relate to that? And I think it's very useful to memorize or take a closer look at the cessation of dukkha. What is uh, the cessation of dukkha? What is dukkha niroda? This is on the bottom of page 107. It is uh, yochasa teva tanhaya asesa viraga nirodo. Uh, it is the remainderless fading and cessation, chago, relinquishment, patinisago, letting go, muti, release, analio, without any attachment. The remainderless fading away and cessation relinquishment, letting go, release, without any attachment. And you'll see appended there the remainderless, all of those things. So each of these words is used as a synonym of Nibbana in certain contexts, of the goal. So this is saying that once we uh, abandon the second noble truth, the cause of dukkha, abandon our unskillful cravings and um, bad habits, then uh, we will, we can realize, and this is what we try to do with this third noble truth, we try to realize the remainderless fading and cessation, uh, relinquishment, letting go, release, without any attachment of that, of that craving, of these bad habits. Um, and it is Nibbana, it is the end, but it, it is also, it can be a strategy for achieving that. So uh, last week at, I'm, when I'm not here, the reason I'm not here full time is because I'm a schoolboy. I'm in university. I'm finishing up a, um, a degree at Dharma Realm Buddhist University. And the unique thing about their um, educational system there is that each semester is a week of contemplative exercise, which is basically a retreat. And each semester, it's a different theme. And last week's theme, uh, the semester's theme, was Tai Chi. So uh, movement in stillness, stillness in movement. So a really beautiful retreat where I learned a lot of good things about uh, practicing Tai Chi. But I feel like many people are kinesthetic or proprioceptive learners, people who learn more through bodily movement from being embodied than they do from all of these heady intellectual teachings. And so to bring this teaching on the third noble truth home, uh, I've been practicing a what we can conceive of as like a Theravada Tai Chi. So uh, I'll teach everybody the movements. So um, if everybody, if you like having your eyes closed, no pressure, but I'll be doing some movements if you wanted to open your eyes. Um, so we'll basically, each one of these six aspects of the third noble truth, the fading away, the fading away, the cessation, the relinquishment, the letting go, the release, and the without any attachment. We're gonna be creating an association with a particular uh, arm and hand gesture movement um, to embody these. And they do both have bodily correlates. There's a, a bodily aspect which you can feel and a mental um, aspect to these. So the first is uh, fading away. So we'll start with both hands just at the head, at the head level. And yeah, just actually put your hands tight, tight around this area. During the retreat, um, one of the Qigong Tai Chi teachers has an exercise called five to minus five. So the principle there is tensing up 
every muscle in your body, if your normal level of non-tension is a zero, you intentionally tense up everything in your body to a level five intensity, a level five intensity, and then you let go into this minus five. So this is the first move. This is the viraga, the disp uh, fading away. So first movement is starting off tense, a five, and then going to minus five, the fading away. This is the first movement. And this viraga, it's literally, raga is passion or it's cognate with the English rouge, like the, that which people kind of put on their, their cheeks sometimes. Uh, it's a reddening. It's a dying of one's experience. And we're letting go of that intensity. You can imagine, like if you were, someone was to take a picture of you at your most angry or your most kind of like you're checking out that dude or that girl and you're, you're most like sketchy kind of <laughs> looking at that, that person and someone was to take a photo of you at that moment, yeah, and it's, it's gonna be ugly. It's gonna be ugly, because, yeah, angry face, yeah, obsessed, you know, kind of sexualized face, it's kind of ugly. So someone was to take that photo, print it out on a normal printer, put it outside, and just let it sit there over a, uh, a summer, just let it sit there for a week, a month, several months, let it get the rain and the wind and the sun and the sun, and eventually, all of that color is just going to naturally drain out. That's what we're doing. That's the, the mental movement. And we're intentionally, from this cognitive space, so many of us are caught up in our heads. And with this viraga, this dispassion, we are intentionally unhooking, unhooking from the, that which is beset, obsessed behind the eyeballs, that which is attached. So we're unhooking this dispassion, so releasing there. The next moment, motion, the next movement, the next gesture is cessation. And this is niroda. So coming up from here and then just relaxing down to a heart level. Niroda, ni, the ni here in Pali means down. So it's a downward movement. Rud is a root meaning an obstruction or a rolling on. So niroda is that which stops the rolling. It's that which makes the mind come down, and this is the release from a uh, cognitively, cerebrally obsessed and tight, you've relaxed with uh, fading away, and then just bringing your awareness down into your body, bringing awareness down into the body. As the hands move down, awareness comes into the body. So niroda, this is kind of like this stopping of the, the wheel. Uh, it's like um, Roadrunner and uh, Wile Coyote, like Roadrunner, he's, she's, Wile e. Coyote's chasing him, goes off the cliff, uh, Roadrunner goes to the side, Wile e. Coyote goes off the cliff, and then keeps running a bit, and then when he realizes he's off of the cliff, obviously he falls down. And that's what we can do with this letting go, the cessation, cessation of uh, this cerebrally obsessed coming down into the heart space. So fading away, cessation. The next is relinquishment, chaga. So coming out with And this is a useful gesture. It can be, um, why have our, uh, the only associations we have with meditation be in a still posture? We move in the world, so coming out with this chaga, this is relinquishment. So when our awareness is inside the body like this, as I was suggesting in the meditation, you'll realize when you close your eyes and start feeling, where is the outer limit of my body? Where is the skin? Where is the peel? If you are inside of a grape, it seems like, or inside of a balloon, it seems like you'd be able to reach out and I can feel the edge of my skin like that. Um, I used to uh, volunteer at the Contemporary Art Museum of Cincinnati and uh, they had this artist who would paint things in latex paint and then uh, like humans in latex paint and then escape the person from the latex paint. It forms like this latex shell and then he would blow up the shell so you've got this kind of like floppy skin-like thing. And it was kind of neat. Um, but it's not like that. When you are embodied, eyes closed, and even not eyes closed, it's fuzzy. You can't feel an outer limit, or at least I can't. Experiment with that. So with this chaga, with this relinquishment, releasing those boundaries, realizing that uh, where is the boundary between inside and outside? So relinquishment. And letting go, you've expanded your awareness 
from outside, you've let your awareness see, oh, actually, it seems like I can feel beyond the uh, confines of this skin bag. And then letting go is just coming back in. I can include both internal and external. So I've relinquished mindfulness out, expanding how wide can mind be, and then letting go to come back in and include the internal cessation. So fading away, cessation, relinquishment, letting go. The next is release, which is muti. So just from hands that have come in with letting go, to move. release is the word here. And muti is the Pali word, and that should be easy to remember because it just sounds like a party. Muti, release, liberation, freedom, muti, much, mocha, vimoka, uh, all of these things. It's a, it's a, a liberative feeling. And then just this letting go and setting down of, of our mental obsessions. And the final move is without any attachment. So we've come down and then just hands down and then without any further attachments, analio, not, not attaching. So that all of those six movements again are, we're tense, we're obsessed with certain idea, whether it's in meditation or throughout our daily life, and we, we raga, we fade away from that. Relinquishment, down, which is niroda, patin, uh, chaga, which is relinquishment. We relinquish our sense that we're only contained within the body, then letting go back in, including the body and the outside, then release, muti, and then without any attachment, just hands coming down. And this can be an exercise which I've been doing both in meditation and in daily life. And you don't have to do the full uh, six, um, you can, and you can start from that analio without any further attachment, back up to the head, and then go through the full again. Or just stay with any one of those. Stay with any one of those. Fading away, cessation, relinquishment, release, uh, letting go, release, and without any attachment. And this is, we can relate to our convert Buddhist dukkha in any of these ways. When you come down to meditation and the mind is not as peaceful as you want it to be, okay, uh, relinquish, just um, release this ideal because none of us are ideals. None of us are um, exactly the way we want to be all the time in every way. And certainly our meditative lives aren't going to be like that. And with our precepts, you know, we, it's good to be able to hold on to them. Um, but the stress, the mental stress that we build up around the good habits that we want to, uh, to live, when we can't, um, when our mind is not going along with that, let there be a sense of fading, a uh, sense of cessation, relinquishment, release, letting go an opening and an including of what seems like dissonance. And when you do that, when you're able to do this, when you're able to open up to, this is how things are, this is how the body is, this is how the mind is, um, but then include that this is how the mind is, this is how the body is, uh, you can be at peace with it and uh, actually experience a type of meta, single T, um, overarching, overlooking uh, perspective of peace, which you don't actually have to uh, completely get rid of all of the obstructive mental states uh, at that time. So leave the talk there. And Andamayam Dhammakataya Sadhu Karam Tadamase Sadhu 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 Anumodha So we can uh, open things up to questions. And um, I guess, Matt, are you going to be the mic runner or just a question? Okay, great. Matt, well, if anybody wants to ask a question, if people on, have questions on Zoom, you can raise your hand. Um, so I can't see the name from there, and I can't tell who that is. Um, Joseph. Okay. Can you unmute uh, Joseph? Hey, Joseph. Oh, great. There at the same time, um, I just wanted to say, take this opportunity to say thank you for practicing and the entire Clear Mountain community 
I was so moved by last week's uh, talk, and you guys have been so kind. Please, you're venerable, sirs. You've been so very kind. Um, please allow me uh, an opportunity to express that because I, I struggle with communication, so I wanted to show you how uh, much gratitude I have. Can you see this? Do you see this? This is a, is that clear on the screen? A heart? Is that so this, this heart glass represents the entire Clear Mountain community, and this represents all beings right here. Can you see that? Is that clear? Yeah? Okay. This cup represents all my appreciation and gratitude for you. Can you see that? Is that clear? Yeah? So this is how I feel. This is, this is what I feel right here. This is, I wanted to say just thank you so much. I just want to you guys are amazing. I wish you every happiness in the world. May you abide in happiness forever. And thank you for everything. Thank you for practicing. You know, just thank you so much. I'm just so incredibly grateful. <laughs> and I just wish you every happiness. May you be free from suffering. And may you be triple blissful. Triple. All, every bliss. Every bliss. Just that's, that's, I just wanted to say thank you so much for practicing. And may you be happy forever. Oh, thank you, Joseph. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Yeah. Everyone here sadhu you, Joseph. And was that, was that a, a smoothie, or was that a, <laughs> so. I like gold Play-Doh. <laughs> Whoa, gold Play-Doh, impressive. I'll Thanks, Joseph. With this. Awesome. May you all be, may your hearts be clean with sun, light. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the talk. I just wanted to say that I really resonate with the metaphor of the wild, the mind being like a pack of wild horses that you have to tame. I absolutely love that. Um, years back when I first started practicing, I realized that my mind was addicted to beating myself up. It, it really was like an addiction of the mind. And so once I started just observing that, um, I mean, it took, it took a while, but as I was observing it and just bringing awareness to that, it did start to fade away. And so I just, I, I really resonate with that whole experience of the, these wild horses <laughs> um, and that they, they can be tamed. Cool. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, there's a lot of horse metaphors in the, the Pali Canon, um, even just that part of the recollection of the Buddha is Sarati, uh, uh, one who is teach, uh, who trains perfectly those who wish to be trained. The literal word is like one who's a, a charioteer of those who be trained, basically someone who works with horses, someone, a horse trainer, the best horse trainer ever uh, is the Buddha. So yeah, that's cool that you uh, identified with that, Derek. Uh, hi, I have a question about communication. I'm wondering, I'm, I'm noticing in my communications with others, particularly in groups, but even one-on-one, -on -one, uh, wanting to be included and seen, and particularly, I think a lot of this comes from wanting others to understand me, wanting others to understand what I have to say, um, and more often than not, there's a feeling that that is not happening uh, and that I'm unable to communicate what I mean. And I'm not really sure how to dismantle that or even to start addressing what's happening there. And I'm wondering if you could give me any advice on how to see that when it's happening, how to understand what is happening in my mind as I communicate, as I think I have to say one more thing and always, you know, put in my two cents to be understood. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Um, I think that's a really common, um, yeah, common feeling among people. And uh, we talked about it a bit yesterday. Um, I do feel like you know, having this theme of the third noble truth um, 
oftentimes, as you were describing it yesterday and described just now, sometimes it can feel that, um, not sometimes it can feel like a compulsion to, to speak or um, I, I feel that image of the wheel rolling, the niroda, the uh, relinquishment is good to be able to um, kind of keep some kind of perspective or uh, at least to internally relate to that. And it's good, I mean, on an external level, it's, you can choose your environment. Like what groups are you hanging out with? Are you hanging out with people who are sensitive to the, those kind of dynamics? People who are actually uh, paying attention to how much everybody is sharing and um, inclusive and looking at people's micro gestures to see if they have anything to share. And uh, so designing your environment to the extent you can, choosing your friends, your Kalyanamitta, your awesome, your awesome friends, um, that's really useful. That goes a, a hugely long way. Um, and then, yeah, relating to the internals of it, just how much of it is necessary, how much of it is uh, unnecessary, um, dukkha. I thought about actually um, weaving into the talk um, this theme of a third arrow or a third dart. So people are familiar with the simile of the, the two darts or the two arrows. So mm -hmm. Uh, you've got this first arrow, you're hit by an unpleasant feeling in the body. And uh, most people relate to that by just uh, adding more dukkha, mental dukkha, on top of the physical dukkha. So the physical unpleasantness is the first arrow, and all of the mental elaboration that we add on top of that is the second arrow. But a third arrow for Western converts, or really for anybody who's you know, coming up to a wall which seems like is the boundary between where they're at versus where they want to be. Um, it's this third arrow of not just mental suffering, but suffering because I'm suffering. Um, it's like, I don't like this kind of suffering. I, I don't like not being able to do what I want to do. And that's kind of um, the convert Buddhist dukkha. It's this, I've reached a limit of what I, what I can do, what I feel comfortable with. And there's slightly different ways to relate to that, that third arrow, that third dart, um, but it can definitely be, be let go um, and to at least only have two arrows. Um, you know, eventually you want to get down to just the first arrow, but uh, start pulling them out you know, strategically. Um, yeah, I think um, that's a really common one. Um, and I think it's useful to look at when we chanted the Four Noble Truths at the beginning, the cause of suffering being craving to become, uh, to not become, which is annihilation and sensual pleasure. And I think it was Long Porsu Medu who said, if it, if it begins with ignorance, it'll end up in suffering every time. And same with craving. So um, I think often when you feel that uh, impulse to be heard, to and you can really feel the flavor of that drive. It's almost like this raw vibrating wound. You know, it's raw, it's uh, animal. And really to, um, that's when we hold still and don't act on it, don't create karma based on it. Um, and if you need to really use a skillful means, like take a brief walk or come to a mantra or just say the very basic that's necessary, the, you know, the, the, the minimum that's necessary for the conversation, then that's good. But you don't necessarily want to act in that comma because it's tanha craving never results in, in peace. It'll never, that hunger never gets filled that way. Um, you know, the ordering of the four noble truths, I often think it's helpful because it points out that only once you've kind of endured through that suffering and that craving, you know, then you touch peace on the other end of that. Like you do come through and the drive to be heard or to jump into the conversation does fade. And then there is a moment of peace. And then you see what is the appropriate action, the path, the fourth noble truth reveals itself. But, um, but yeah, I think it's useful to see that like the wellspring of love, it's, it's like a spring and it fills in from the back. So it, it only fills that need for love is only filled by giving. And the more you flow out the more it fills in from the back but trying to fill it from the fronts like taking a bunch of rocks and stuffing it in and just it just backs it up and clogs it um 
So I think that's just really useful to know is the arithmetic of craving never balances out. It always is in the red and it's a non-winning game. And um, the one thing to point out is this word Ajahn Kovila was using, chaga, um, relinquishment. It's a fascinating word because it means both to, both to let go and to give. And the analogy given in the commentaries is a wealthy merchant who throws open the doors of their storehouse and says, everyone take what you would like. Whereas Donna giving is like that person standing at the door giving item after item. And they say there's more merit in that intentional giving, but there's a place for chaga too, with just always having the doors open. And I just think that's such a beautiful ethic for, for our lives. Like all the craving, all that desire for love is, it will be filled, but not by that part, not by that impulse, never only by the opposite. And, uh, and yet all we have to, you know, our only choice is to hold still until it passes and then, and then move from there. So I think we're all in that. Anyone else in that boat often? <laughs> yeah. Thank you for bringing that up, Daniel. Matthew? Uh, uh, yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah, yeah. Namo Buddha, everyone. I just uh, forget that <laughs> on the line. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask um, basically, yeah, the same problem you've discussed uh, earlier that uh, all converts have. I am so to speak a constant convert because I decided to convert to Buddhism uh, since I was 16 years old ish, and now I'm 25. But due to the lack of Buddhist communities in my country, I had a lot of like, yeah, basically problems with. Uh, following learning the buddhist path because yeah i mean when where there is no communities how you're gonna learn right and the internet wasn't really developed uh, a few years ago right it was there but you couldn't actually read it uh from, from like read a lot of information which was in english and at that time i didn't really know english so yeah i practiced and as uh he could just uh, Bhante described it uh when you start with unskillful, uh, with unskillfulness, it'll end in suffering, and that would happen to me. So basically, I was practicing yoga uh, for like two or three, or maybe even four years, and it was pretty hardcore. But I didn't really know what to do. So yeah, it ended up pretty much badly. And now, when I'm trying to actually do something in Buddhism, I constantly feel fear that I'm gonna hurt myself, or that it'll end badly for my body or my mind. And I kind of know that you know some of the things are really serious like you know mantras and stuff like that it really works so i really wanted to know how to deal with that because you know when you're sitting and meditating and your heart is bombing because you're thinking like oh uh that'll end badly for i don't know like my heart or you know like uh you'll hurt yourself yeah it's not the most pleasant experience so uh how to deal with that basically what to do to i don't know like maybe stop it or you know to get out of it yeah Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Um, I mean, part of what you touched on is another aspect of um, Western convert dukkha is, dukkha is just the uh, physicality of not, you know, say, um, even just 50, 40 years ago in Thailand, in, in certain parts of the country, certainly the Northeast, people were used to sitting on the ground. People are used to sitting on the ground. So um, it's easier if someone grew up sitting on the ground um, to do that when you're you're older. So speaking about yeah, growing up in a place where chairs are the norm, since you're old enough to sit, uh, you're going to experience some level of unfamiliarity with um, sitting on the ground. And uh, even just embodiment is another thing which uh, in an, living in a country where the education is so cerebral, is so heady, uh, so many of us are not embodied in you come and you start learning about the first foundation of mindfulness, knowing the body in and of itself, knowing the body in and of itself, kaye kayanupasana, seeing the body in and of itself. It's just a new motion. It's a new mental gesture that you're not familiar with. And um, you might be used to pushing your body further than you're used to go and that you're used to going. And uh, it's really common. Um, and I think being aware of how much of what you're describing is logical fear versus perhaps illogical worry 
you know, they, um, I think oftentimes people can sit longer than um, they think they might be able to. In the commentaries, they talk about um, what is it which obscures dukkha? What is it which obscures seeing suffering, physical, mental, whatever? And the answers that the commentary gives are bodily change of posture. So that's what masks, that's the, that's, that's the curtain why most people might say, what are you talking about, dukkha? You know, all this Buddhist pessimism, you know, it's a, I don't experience suffering and, okay, try to sit for, you know, three minutes longer than you're used to and um, then you'll see it. So you might not have uh, be used to that pushing on the edge of what you're mentally and physically able to do and um, just being smart about that um, and not, there, there's another type of, Western convert dukkha was just wanting and being willing to take on some teacher. Seems like they know what they're talking about. They say, if you want to be a good Buddhist, you want to be a good meditator, you have to sit for an hour at a stretch. Any shorter than that, it's nothing. You have to sit with full lotus posture. Anything less than that, it's, uh, you know, it's not Buddhism or something. And it's easy to fall for those idealistic visions of what it means to be a Buddhist, what it means to be a meditator. But I think here, especially with the body, you need to develop, we all need to develop our own discernment around uh, what actually is wise for ourselves. And can we push that? How, yeah, and, and knowing, knowing ourselves, knowing for yourself, uh, knowing yourself. Is there another Zoom question or? Thank you so much for the, Tai Chi um, practice. I was wondering if you had uh, something to point to for that practice, because I don't know if I'll be able to remember it, like a video or someone to watch for it or something. These videos are, like these live streams are recorded, so that will be up fairly soon. Uh, but we might make another video of it. And I would also recommend, if you're experimenting with it, to do it standing, to do it while standing, and really, uh, as you're paying attention to letting go um, of that, from that fading away into the uh, cessation, really coming down into your whole body and letting uh, almost your energy, um, your felt sense of the body kind of drop, drop down even into the floor. Um, so yeah, it's a good idea. Maybe we'll make a, a video. There's not yet one up. Thank you. Ajans, I'm going to assume that you both at one point had comfort zeal. And how did you, I'm going to make that assumption. Or I know Ajahn Nisabo, you grew up in a Theravada home. So uh, uh, Ajahn Kovilo, I'm going to assume you had comfort zeal at one point. How did you know that your zeal had given way to authentic Nibbida? I'll talk about one particular type of convert zeal and convert dukkha that I experienced is um, based on this convert zeal um, enthusiasm and having a clear moral. I've got a clear picture, five precepts, that's the way I want to be speaking, um, you know, truthfully, not harshly, not backbiting, not doing gossip. I've got this high ideal, but then start creating dukkha for yourself when you start looking outwards at the world and seeing and wanting and expecting everyone, especially Buddhists and monks and nuns, you want them to be always living that. And when you start you know, spraying your ideal and kind of leaking your ideal onto your surrounding, um, it just creates a lot of suffering for you. So I did a lot of that. And uh, I think the Nibida there was just with kind of coming to a place with the good friends that I had around me um, that who were patient through that and um, just but getting serious and good feedback that um, you're doing this, your, uh, your expectations are leaking basically. And uh, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. You're looking down on me and I can, I can tell. And, uh, and um, yeah, and not wanting to do that. Like the harmlessness, I really don't want to do that. Before I was a Buddhist, I didn't do that. You know, I wasn't like finding fault with people. 
So why is it now that I have an ideal that I start doing it? Um, so that that's just one aspect. Um, you must have had some convert. Zero. Um, I think the uh, it's it's interesting how we translate samadhi often as concentration, like one point and just staying there. And I feel like we really aim that word can be an analogy for how we hold an ideal as like this unchanging dynamic, you know, un, unmoving thing we want to embody. And, and of course the broken shifting world and ourselves will never meet that. Um, one huge, uh, shift for me was just reconceptualizing, you know, you'll hear, hear a lot of people retranslate Samadhi as a uh, unification of mind and unification of, of heart. And for me, a sense of grace of movement was a much better uh, metric for my practice. Um, just acknowledging we have all these energies flowing through us. And it's like Longport Cha pointed to still flowing water. Um, often just beginning to reconceptualize what we're aiming at, not as an unmoving ideal, but rather the sense of uh, dharmic resonance and fluidity um, that acknowledges and embodies our natural energies. And that to make, we have a lot of energies and that to make this life workable to create a stream bed deep enough for all of the heart that naturally flows into the path when you realize how profound the Buddha's teachings are is you have to build a world around you that can hold all those energies. So it's one thing to kind of go back to your room and just try to keep your meditation practice and then you keep your job and you know, really you're just practicing a few aspects of the Noble Eightfold Path. What you have to do is come into community. You have to create all these networks that you can give through and bond through you have to schedule a day, a week, or every two weeks where you get to practice. You have to host people at your home and feed them. You have to find you know, ways of bringing in study. Like You have to steadily replace all the junk food you've been feeding yourself with with health food, but you can't just eat power bars. You know, it, it can't just be meditation. It has to be community and all these things. And I'd say that like, you really can build a world that holds all aspects of yourself in a grace of movement and and then there's unity and that z that unhealthy zeal no longer has to have that vibrating raw quality because it's the water's being allowed to flow naturally through through a, a, a stream bed that's deep enough but you have to dig the stream bed so that's what we're we're doing here is monastery is the great missing puzzle piece it's the one thing we don't have and if we have it all those things come together but in the meantime just creating what you can out of out of what we have and there is enough so that was the biggest shift for me is acknowledging I, I didn't for the first few years when I was at the monastery my parents would always ask so are you making any friends and I'd say I'm not here to make friends <laughs> I'm here to meditate and then like a few days later like lying on my kuti floor sweating I'd just be like I just need to <laughs> so that was a big shift for me um you relate Ajahn yeah we do have to wrap stuff up about now. Um, any final words before we do? Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. We have to wrap stuff up. Um, okay. Well, first, um, as all of you know, Ajahn Kovilo is is he's the other foundation of this project, and he's visiting us a few months a year. But he's we text all the time. Um, he's involved in all the meetings and not all the meetings, but almost all the meetings. We have a lot of meetings. Um, and he's just been, uh, you know, for those of you who haven't gotten a chance to know him, he's just such a beautiful, wonderful monk. Um, uh, and he won't look down on you. Uh, <laughs> I'll try, I'll try. <laughs> he'll try. So just want to really celebrate him coming and we'll get him again in December, but this is such a nice visit. Thank you for coming, Ajahn. And three big sadhus for Ajahn. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.